What's up? It's Penuel, the Black Pen, making this video from my hotel room in Ningbo, China. Not sure when this video is going to drop, but I hope it's going to be very soon. Um, in particular, because this week, today, I'm recording this on the, I think the 6th, if I'm not mistaken, the 6th of July. And I know this week is Craven Week. Um, I'm not sure where it's, I know I, I read somewhere where it's, it's happening this year, but I've, I've forgotten. Craven Week is the premier rugby schools week. In South Africa so for an entire week some of the best rugby playing boys across all the high schools in South Africa come together representing their provinces and they play these matches and then there's like an unofficial final and then from there the selectors select like a South African school site and what Cravenick does is it creates this platform where young boys can literally kickstart their future careers in rugby professionally a lot of boys get offered contracts uh, while they're there. Some of them, if they may be in grade 11, some if they're really special in grade 10, some of them get offered scholarships and bursaries to other schools, whether for grade 11, grade 12, some of them for post-matric. Um, and then a lot of them get given contracts. Blue Bulls, Sharks, Western Province, the Lions, etc. And normally with these contracts, you're going to get like a, a tertiary education, maybe at a UJ, at a Tux, at a Wits. Uh, maybe at a UCT, uh, maybe at a UKZN, um, etc. And then from studying for free, which is pretty dope, uh, sometimes you get uh, paid a, an amount of money, specifically if you're playing in the Varsity Cup, which uh, thanks to Franco Pinar and the team at Varsity Sports has become a really great platform that launches a lot of other kids into professional rugby, senior professional rugby, and all the way into the spring box. So Craven Week is an under-18 uh, competition the under 16 competition is called the Gran Homo uh, week I'm not sure who Gran Homo is feel free to please go and research I know at some point uh, some of my mates are trying to school me on who Grant is and then under 13 days the Craven week under 13 Craven week as well normally the under 13 Craven week is first then you'll have the under 16 Gran Homo week and then you'll have the under 18 Craven week really really amazing structures that have been created uh, by the South African Rugby Union and all the guys that ran it back in the day. Donny Craven, I think people like Louis Late uh, helped uh, rugby to become professional in South Africa. So a young nine-year-old boy basically has an idea of how to make it in professional rugby going through the structures. Not everyone goes through the structures. There have been a lot of other people that never got to play under 13 Craven Week, under 16 Grand Homo Week, under 18 Craven Week. But because they were really talented, really committed, even after high school, they found themselves working really hard to be selected and they become really, really amazing professional players as well. So I want to commend Saru. I want to commend everyone who gets involved in these rugby weeks because they literally change young boys' lives. There are boys that are discovered at under 13 and given high school bursaries. There are boys that are discovered at under 16 and given bursaries and scholarships. Um, there are boys that are discovered, of course, at under 18 and kickstarts their lives. They get to become student athletes which is a really dope term that comes out in the movie Coach Carter with Samuel L. Jackson. Student athletes, understanding that you can go to tertiary for free because of your sporting gift and you need to use that sporting gift and that free education because sports only last that long for the average person. Your career might, professional sports, might last three to five if you're lucky, 10 years. And then you need something to fall back on. Not everyone is going to become a referee. Not everyone is going to become a rugby coach. Um, not everyone's going to become an analyst so you need to study something worthwhile so that after your rugby career is over you can go and work so shout out to everyone who's involved in the structures shout out to all the top schools that offer bursaries and scholarships you look at our captain of the Springboks today Sia Kolis, Samtanda Kolisi who was given a bursary scholarship throughout his high school career at Gray High School in PE part of the issue we have is the Part of the issue we have is the controversy around the selection for Craven Week provincial sites. There are a lot of good rugby schools in the country. And normally, if you are at a good rugby school, the good rugby school is normally where they pick the coach for the provincial team. It's normally where they pick the selectors for the provincial team. And if you're not studying at one of these schools, unfortunately, you will not get selected, even if you're way better than some of the boys at these schools. And the coaches and the selectors that go to these schools have an allegiance. Because this school hires them. The school pays their salary. So the least they can do to pay back the school is to select as many boys as possible from there. I can mention some of the schools. A lot of them are the Afrikaans uh, schools. 
If you look at places like Gauteng, you've got uh, Oerswol Garsfontein, you've got Menlo Park, um, you've got Afrikaans Science Oerswol, which is Afis, you've got Waterkloof, uh, in Joburg side or in the West Rand, you've got uh, Oerswol Kreisdorp, I mean, sorry, not Oerswol Kreisdorp, you've got Monument, sorry, in Kreisdorp, um, and then you've got the English schools in Gauteng, you've got private schools like St. Albans, you've got uh, Pretoria Boys High, which is the most expensive public school in the country, You've got King Edward School Cares in Johannesburg. You've got private schools like St. Stithians, St. John's College, private as well. JP Boys in Joburg. Um, I know North Cliff High is on the rise. These are some of the schools that they select from for the Lions and for the Blue Bulls at Craven Week. And then you've got the Falker, the Falcons, where they pick from schools like Dr. Ierge Janssen. Some of the schools in the East Rand, I think Marie Fulun and the like. Gauteng sends three teams to Craven Week. The Lions in Joburg the Bulls in Pretoria, and then the Falker in the East Rand. Then you've got Mpumalanga, which unfortunately only sends one team, even though they should probably send two. Schools like HTS Middleburg, uh, schools like Nalspreit, uh, Lofelt, um, but there are so many schools in Pumalanga that it's almost unfair to only have one team, which has been one of my criticisms for KZN, which got a lot, it's a huge province. It's a huge province, got a lot of schools, but generally they only send one Sharks team and that Sharks team picks from also like a lot of good schools Peter Maritzburg College, Glenwood uh, Kersney College which is private um, now and then maybe a St. Charles where King Misuzulu uh, went to school um, which schools am I forgetting Maritzburg College, Glenwood uh, Durban Boys High as well and a couple of other schools but if you go up north where I come from, Newcastle High Ladysmith, Freyheit, Dundee we should have our own team um, that goes to Craven Week. At some point, they had a KZN country and districts. I don't know if they still send it now. Um, you've got Limpopo, which sends the Limpo Limpopo Blue Bulls um, to Craven Week. You've got the Northwest, which sends the Leopards. Uh, boys from like Pochefstrom, Boys High. If you went to Pochefstrom, Boys High and you played first team, you've got a very good chance. The Free State sends two teams. You've got the Free State Cheaters, which is generally a grey college team. If you didn't make the Free State team and you play first team at Great College, you need to look at your life. Sometimes they might pick boys from St. Andrews, Bloom. Then you've got the Griffins um, from the Free State where they pick from some of the boys from some of the other schools there. Um, you've got the Northern Cape, which sends one team, I believe, which is a Krikwas. Or Krikwas. Diamantfeld, I think, is one of the schools. Kimberley Boys High. I don't know if it's still there. Kimberley Boys High, was. those are some of the schools that it picked from for the Krikwas. And then you'd have the Eastern Cape and you'd have the Western Cape, which send a lot of boys. And where generally a chunk of our talent, in particular black and colored talent, comes from. Zulu boys in KZN generally play soccer. If you go to some of the top rugby schools in, in Durban, in Peter Maritzburg, etc., a lot of them are actually Kosa boys that were brought in with bursaries and scholarships. In the Eastern Cape, they generally send four teams. They send East, the Eastern Province Elephants. They send Eastern Province Country and Districts. They send border, and then they send border country and, and uh, border country and districts. Border is schools like uh, Dale College uh, in King Williamstown, Queens College in Queenstown, Salborn College in East London. Um, you might feature schools like uh, Hudson, uh, Stirling, maybe a Cambridge, uh, etc. Border country and districts is normally like the rural boys that wouldn't get a chance to get to some of these really top schools. You've got Eastern Province, which would be Gray High School. You might find, I think, Marlow. Um, you might find uh, Daniel Pinar, I think. Um, some of the top schools in PE in those areas. I think they might feature Grahamstown, uh, which is St. Andrew's Private School, Graham College, um, Kingswood. And then there's also Eastern Province Country and Districts. And I'm not sure if they take from some of those schools. You've got schools like Muir College as well and some of the other schools there. Uh, PJ Ulifir, Mary Waters, Colored School in Grahamstown, etc. So they send four. Western Province, uh, Western Cape, I think, sends Western Province. They send Borland. Uh, they send the Southwestern District Eagles, the SWD Eagles. Um, you've got so many top rugby schools in the Western Cape. Uh, Borland, Lanpo, Paul Boys High, uh, Paul Gymnasium, Paul Ruiz, schools like Bishops, schools like Weinberg Boys High, schools like Sachs, uh, Tigerberg, uh, Durbanville, a lot of schools, Colored uh, schools, uh, private schools, etc. And they tend to dominate Craven. Western province, 
the blue and white tend to dominate. Free State Cheetahs with Grey Plume tend to dominate. Every now and then, Eastern Province with their Grey Boys will be good. Once in a while, Border will be good if they have some boys from um, Salborn, maybe a Dell Queens that are cooking. The Sharks tend to be a very strong team because they take from the top guys in the south. Unfortunately, the guys from the north tend to get snubbed. Uh, the Pumas, uh, which is Mpumalanga, is kind of okay. Limpopo Blue Pools are okay. Um, Gauteng obviously has a, a quite a... The Blue Pools, of course, are quite heavy. Um, the Lions tend to be good, especially in the recent years. Uh, the Falca are kind of okay. Uh, the Leopards are kind of okay. And the Griquas tend to be okay. I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anyone. I know Zimbabwe tends to send a team. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any teams I've forgotten. Did I get all our provinces? Western Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Free State, KZN, Mpumalanga, Gauteng, Northwest, Limpopo, Northern Cape. I hope I mentioned all of them. Sorry, this unnecessary intel for people that aren't rugby mad like I used to be growing up. There's a lot of politics in sports. So I'm already telling you that there's issues with the fact that certain boys go to certain schools i'm already telling you that uh, well issues with certain boys that go to certain schools there aren't enough teams certain provinces get to send more teams than other provinces um then there's more politics like even within the schools certain boys that are talented don't get to play for the first team and don't get selected certain boys aren't liked by the selectors and don't get selected and then there's race <laughs> then there's race I remember when Nelson Mandela and Steve Chwete, Itaimala Maishome, um, was standing on the podium at the 1995 World Cup, um, handing over the trophy to Francois Pinar and the rest of the Springboks that won the World Cup, the first World Cup that the Springboks were allowed to compete in since the apartheid sports sanctions were removed. You know, using Springboks to unite the country. John Smith would go on with his team to pick up the Webb Ellis trophy as well, and then followed by Siamtanda Kolisi, uh, at the last World Cup, which was really, really special. Our first official black captain, even though we've had Chili Boy Ralepele, who was the first uh, black captain and the young Springbok captain as well, a boy from Pretoria Boys High. Sia Kolisi was asked at an interview in Japan how he feels about quotas. And his response was he doesn't like quotas. He believes everyone should be picked on merit. He doesn't believe Nelson Mandela would have approved of quotas. It makes a lot of the black boys feel like they're inadequate and they were only selected for race. I remember listening to that interview and I remember getting very, very angry, very upset. I was part of a really cool group of gents from all these top uh, schools, mostly black gents. And I remember venting there. Um, how could Kolisi say something like this? Uh, does he not understand the importance of quotas, etc.? Uh, Touch Rugby Sundays was the name of the group and the name of the WhatsApp group in particular. And I remember we were playing touch rugby on one of the Sundays in Joburg at Pirates Rugby Club in Greenside. And ex-Springbok and rugby analyst and commentator now, Tobani Bobo, from Dale College initially. And then he was given a bursary scholarship at Rondebosch, another top school in the Western Cape. And he became the first black captain of SA schools as a flank slash center. Before him, there was, uh, there was a colored gent. I just, I forget his name. I know the guys always try to remind me of his name. Uh, yes, yes, I forget his name. Colored Gent was the first captain, and then um, Kobani Bob, first black African captain. Became uh, something fanatical. He had a beard, he had dreadlocks, he listened to Talib Kwali and Most Deaf. He was part of a band. He was way ahead of his time with Kobani, and I don't think South African rugby was ready for him at that time. He used to give offloads like Sonny Paul Williams before Sonny Paul Williams' SBW was dope. But I don't think our rugby was ready for that level of skill. At the time, because it was still very big and blue pools, pick up and drive, mauling rugby. So Bunny Bobo came to chat to me and he was like, you know, I, I read your, your chats in the group and uh, I fully understand. And I largely agree with everything you were saying. And he was like, you know, what's important is we need to protect the boys. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, look, you must understand that when you're playing for the Springboks or playing for a certain province, you are part of a team. And in this team, like Kusia Kolis with the Springboks, he's not alone. Of course, there's black players himself, Lukanyo A, Magazole, Mapimpi, and other guys, uh, Trevor Nyagane, uh, Bongim Bonambi, and others. Then there's obviously the colored guys, you know, Marvin Ori, Cheslin Colby, 
Um, there's the new wing now. I think Aronsa is his surname. Um, I'm trying to think who else might be there. But there's other colored gents there as well. Um, Herschel, Yankees, Jaden Hendricks, one of my favorite uh, schoolboy rugby players from Glenwood, um, etc. Oh, Damien Willem, sir. Yes, sir. So how am I forgetting the gents? Paul Ruiz, boy. Uh, discovered by the Rupert family and then given a bursary scholarship at, at Paul Ruiz Gymnasium. Then you've got the white guys, of course. Every now and then, the English boys <laughs> who normally get snubbed because they don't like Afrikaans and they hate Afrikaans and rugby in South Africa at the highest levels is very Afrikaans. I remember a friend and a huge business juggernaut today, Ulungisa Chele, saying, if you play rugby boy and you can't speak Afrikaans, it tells me that you've never played at the highest level. Because you kind of have to, have to, you have to understand Afrikaans if, if you want to play at those levels. The coaches, the staff, the best players are normally Afrikaans because the white boys and the coloreds speak Afrikaans. Every now and then they'll bring in like a Percy Montgomery from Saks. They'll bring in a Pat Lambie from Michael House. I forgot Michael House and Hilton in KZN. Uh, they'll bring in a, a John Schmidt uh, from Pretoria Boys High. Every now and then we appreciate the English boys that kind of make it. Um, then you've got a lot of the Afrikaans guys, you know, that go to the Afrikaans schools. And the Afrikaans schools dominate, boy. Huge. You look at the locks. Victor Matfield, I think, went to Afis, if I'm not mistaken. Bucky's Puerta. Um, uh, who are these big boys? You've got today about Franz Malherbe. Uh, Eben Etzebeth. I don't think Eben is Afrikaans, though. He might have gone. I'm not sure which school he went to. I was going to say Weinberg, but I'm not sure. But the Afrikaans guys are big. Peter Stiff to Toy. Franz Lowe. Skalk Berger, who went to Paul Gymnasium. Uh, his father was a Springbok as well, Skalk Berger Sr. Um, obviously, Jean de Villiers, uh, who I think went to Paul Gym. Got guys like uh, Jacques Fourie, who went to Monument. H huge Afrikaans guys. Now, Ukobani emphasized that, look, these guys are one team. And if Ukolis is going to go out there and say something that is going to upset his teammates, it's going to kill the energy and the spirit in the team so whatever he says has to protect the team and if he's going to be captain he needs to remember that as captains almost like being president of south africa i remember barack obama speak about being president of america not president of black america president of all america siakolis is captain of the entire team he's not captain of the black players he's not captain of the colored players he's a captain of the entire team so he makes he needs to make sure that in whatever he says when he goes back to practice when he's on the field, the white guys, the colored guys, the black guys all say this guy speaks on behalf of all of us. Not some of us, but all of us because we are one team. It's why you probably won't hear Magazole, Mabimpi, Lukanyo Am, etc. speaking about racism and those things because he needs to protect the team. It's sad, but it's one of those things. And I, I began understanding then and I kind of changed my stance. I've always loved to see Akolis from the times we used to watch him at high school at Grey P when he was called Shrek. And he took on from Oyam, Yamgel and Tola. Guys like Marlon Reiters. Kuma Fass. Who were amazing at Grey PE. Uh, Cohen Bosch. Another Grey PE boy. Uh, who's sensational. Sia Kolisi never asked to be an activist. He never asked to be a politician. He never asked to speak up for black people. He was a young chap. Huge. Really good at rugby from his Zuite. And he was scouted. And when he got to Grey PE, he met these amazing white boys who became his friends. It's one of the things that I try to speak about when I speak about non-racialism, that my upbringing wasn't just in a black township. Some of my best friends growing up were white kids, Afrikaans kids, Indian kids, Muslim, colored kids. So when I speak, I can't say I'm just speaking for black kids because that's not my reality. See, I call this, he studied in high school with like really, really dope white kids that became his best mates. And while he was playing in high school, he met this amazing chick called Rachel, who ended up becoming his wife. So, he was really good at rugby. He wanted to wear the green and gold and represent the Springboks. He never asked to be a political activist. So, it's almost malicious when commentators, analysts, interviewers ask him political questions about things like quotas, about things like racism. Because he's not allowed to speak about that because it's not really his reality. He can tell you his reality and say, look, I don't really see color. And he can prove it. He's got colored kids. He's got a white wife. He's got white mates. He's got black mates. He speaks his course. He speaks English. I hope he understands some Afrikaans. Um, and that's Sia, bro. Really dope 
good human being, very lovable. And it was unfair of me to expect him to do that. It's meant to be the politicians that fight for these things. And look, one of the things that happens when some of the black players leave is they start speaking about the racism. You've got... Um, who are the people that have been quite vocal? Ah, Khrotman, how can I forget him? Ah, anyways, but people like Chester Williams have spoken about racism. I think Okaya Mulatana have spoken somewhat about racism. Um, Dion Kayser may have mentioned something along those lines. Peter De Villiers, who was the ex-Springbok coach, really brilliant. Ex-rugby player as well, who was pretty top. They've spoken about certain racism in certain spaces. Um... There's a Khrotman man. I've just I've forgotten his name, but he's one of the major voices for black players when it comes to racism and transformation in rugby. I can't believe I've forgotten his name and I apologize to him and I'm going to put his name in the description and I drop this video. There is racism in rugby. I can speak categor categorically because I've been playing rugby since I was in grade 5. Nah, I was, yeah, since I was in grade 5. Standard, it was standard 3 at the time. I'm raising this topic because there was a recent uproar because uh, at the under-16 Grand Homo week, um, Western Province got two of their players of color, black colored, injured. And when they were supposed to go to the final, or rather in the semi-final or whatever, they, they didn't feel the right amount of black colored players. And according to the rules, you're supposed to feel a certain number. That's what's called quotas. And because they didn't and they feel the two white players, they got disqualified from the final. A lot of people are really upset. Um, Rob Hersoff sent me an article or a video of, I think, Ronaldo Jos, who I've I debated with. I think it's him that I've debated with uh, on Twitter about the DA. I think he's a DA person. Uh, Rob Hersoff himself supports the DA. I do not support the DA. I will not be voting for the DA. And as much as they may be slightly better at governance than the ANC, I think they generally the same. And John Stianazen has said that they're going to be voting with the ANC of Cyril Ramaphosa if a coalition is needed next year. So it's a no from me. Rob was sending me this thing. He's raised before how he hates quotas. People should be picked on merit. And I told him I'd make a video and I'd, I'd unpack some of this stuff. Other white people I saw on social media, on Twitter and other places, Ernst van Sale himself from Afri Forum, who I've sat with on the panel show, also raised this issue. You know, they've said as Afri Forum that quotas and BEE are reverse racism. We should be looking at merit etc etc and even i i tried to explain under a tweet that he posted why i understand what happened at the crown homo week he wasn't happy other people weren't happy aris van sale said that maybe we'll sit at some point and, and discuss this together and i'm said sure i don't mind so i'm raising this because of what happened there a lot of people are angry under aris van sale's tweet a lot of i believe racist white people posted some, a few black people like myself posted and said we understand, etc. And we, we got attacked. <laughs> Not surprising. I've said before that I think over 80% of white people in, in South Africa are racist. Whether directly or they don't see that they are undercover racist. Black people in this country do not set the race agenda in tone. Black people should never be blamed for the racial issues we have in this country. Because black people from when colonizers came, the Portuguese, what ended up becoming the Afrikaners, the British, black people didn't say, oh, you are gonna be second class citizens here because this is our land, never. The people who did that initially were the British. When they came with their colonial systems and they built the economy and political systems, etc., under the way that they understand them from the UK. And in doing that, they set themselves as the first citizens they made Afrikaners second-class citizens. They put the coloreds and Indians underneath, and then they put black Africans right at the bottom. And then when the Afrikaners came in, they solidified this breakdown, and they made it even worse because they made it law that coloreds, Indians, blacks are at the bottom. They did that. Black people were not to engage, were not allowed to engage in the mainstream economy. They couldn't play in certain sports. They couldn't be in certain spaces. They would be slacks, blancas. You know, these were white people that set these rules. The reason the Springboks and other teams couldn't compete globally was because of racism, not set by black people. Now, when the ANC, PAC, Azapo, APLA, MK, and other people were fighting during the struggle, 
They were fighting against segregation and exclusion. And arguably they won. There was a negotiated settlement at Codessa, etc., etc. Today we have this democratic South Africa. And the ANC and the negotiations at that time were saying, look, we will try and correct the imbalances of the past by setting up affirmative action, employment equity, black economic empowerment, and then quotas in sports. Why? Why would they do that? Why would they not just say, oh, let's, let's just focus on merit? It's because of the forced privileges that other people had. It is because black kids couldn't go to good schools. Black kids couldn't come from parents that come from money so that they have a good nutrition at home. They couldn't be in certain areas and therefore they wouldn't be able to be picked into certain sporting teams. They wouldn't be able to be hired in certain companies. I mean, if the company is Herself and Sons and you need to speak English, I didn't grow up speaking English because I was in a Bantu education system. So I kind of need like a leg up. It's what the Afrikaners did with the Bruderbund and what happened when the National Party came in. They prioritized Afrikaans businesses. They prioritized Afrikaans farmers. And that was a form of quota. That was a form of employment equity. That was a form of affirmative action because they knew they needed to put their people or to put their people at the same level as the British. It's what is done the world over. It's what the Jews did when they asked for reparations from Nazi Germany because they realized we need help. The ANC did the same. It was the right thing to do. And any white person that believes it was the wrong thing to do is a racist. Whether you're aware of it or not, it is racist because you refuse to acknowledge the, the legal privileges that got you to study at a bishop's, that got you to study at Michael House, that got you to study at, at Kez and St. Stithians. And that black kids, their parents were, were, if they were lucky, nurses and police officers, but they were miners and factory workers and maids. They weren't just going to be able to see a police just jump up. See a police getting into great PE is a leg up. The next white kid will be like, but that's unfair. Why does he get to be on a bursary on a scholarship? Why can't I? I, I also come from a poor family, but it's because of quotas. Great PE and some of these other top schools know they need to meet quotas and they want to make sure that their kids from their schools get to be the ones that go to a Craven Week and make essay schools, etc. And Great PE today can boast, oh, we've got a Springbok captain who they didn't really develop. They gave him the platform, but he was developed by Ikasi. Shout out to Den Krek and the Krek family. Shout out to Tumsanu Dwight, close friend of mine from high school. His grandfather was an activist. He's got a stadium named after him. Um, Denkeke Stadium. These are people, Nkanunu, um, I think is his surname. Silas might be. These are the people that were pushing for transformation in rugby. People like Alistair Kutia, Peter De Villiers. People that understood that you're not going to be taken seriously. And what I've tried to explain or I tried to highlight to maybe people like Aaron Svansay or Rob Hersoff and the like is with my experience, a lot of the coaches growing up would be white Afrikaners. A lot of the selectors would be white Afrikaners. And a lot of them would be racist. So when they have to select a team, even if you are good, they would not select you because you're black. They would select their own boys. On top of that, of course, they're probably friends with the fathers. They go to the same in Khiakar. They work at the same business. The fathers maybe sponsor the teams. My parents can't sponsor the teams because we come from poverty, because of apartheid. So they're friends with these people, they drink Grander Vein, they prize. So when you have to pick, you have to select whoever's son, Van der Merwe's son and Smith's son and Lowe's son. It's, it's what happens now with BEE and tenders. Cyril Ramaphosa will put Mutsipe on, will put Khatebe on, will put Matozoma on, will put Zim on. They'll put, because they're in the same spaces. And you see this new black elite, because they send their kids to the St. City and St. John's. They send their kids to the Hilton's Michael House, to the bishops, to the Kingswood Colleges. They send their kids to these same top private schools. So their kids get to be in the same spaces. And when it's time for jobs, when it's time for... I mean, that's why Andile Ramaphosa can do big deals. He didn't go to a top school, but it's one of the arguments for Tutuzani Zuma because his father was somewhere. So you want to get into these circles where these kids of these black elites are in because they will give you a leg up. These Afrikaans coaches and selectors would pick white boys. And the only way they could pick black boys is if they were forced through quotas. At some point, they would pick the worst black boys to try and dismantle the system and to say, look, look at the black boys. They, they're costing the team. And then at some point, they realize these quotas aren't going anywhere. So we need to pick the best. So they pick the best black boys. But the next sad thing is that they would only pick enough black colored boys to make the quota. So if the quota is four black, that would be the only number of black boys in the team. Are the boys good enough? We don't know. 
There might be some black colored boys that are better, but they won't make it because they'll never pick them. That's racial bias. We see it, man. We see it with the Chinese in South Africa. We see it with the Indians in South Africa. When it's time to give funding and a leg up, they will give it to their own Indian boys and girls. That's how it works. There's no merit. Everyone is racially biased. Except black people when they have to buy. Black people will buy from Indians, Chinese, whites. White Afrikaners to this day will buy Ace Hanuit, will watch CakeNet, will support white Afrikaans businesses, will send their kids to white African schools. Unfortunately, black people don't pump into black township schools to turn them into a Waterkloof, Afis, Monument, Paul Gim, Paul Roos. They won't do that, sadly. A Daniel Pinar, a Voortrekker. They won't do that. A Pioneer, etc. Which is something that needs to be fixed in the psyche of the black man. And I think it's also because the leadership, unlike the National Party, unlike the British colonial leadership, unlike Jewish leadership, they don't put their people first. The ANC government was meant to say, we are going to pump money into black township schools to make sure that they do better. We're going to pump money into black sports so that at some point the kids can get picked on merit. We will make sure that when it comes to business, we prioritize black, what BEE was meant to be. But BEE was infiltrated by white people who made sure that they got token blacks, puppets. People like at some point Cyril, Patrice to be the faces of their businesses while they make the most of their money. Vuyo Jack, one of the champions of black economic empowerment, has said over 80% of BEE money has ended up in white hands. It has been a failure and it has only uplifted a few uh, black people and it hasn't trickled down to the masses. If you look at white Afrikaners, they've generally benefited. If you look at white English people, they've generally benefited. Black people have not generally benefited from BEE and affirmative action and employment equity because the black leaders have failed in those systems that they were meant to do. To equalize. Because that's the whole point. The constitution speaks about it. Fixing the imbalances of the past. Land, economy, job prospects, sports, etc. Any white person. Any white person that believes. Even after 30 years. That kids should be picked on merit in sports. And that you believe that the coaches and the selectors are fair and don't see color. You are lying to yourself. Or you're just a racist. And you're in denial of your racism. And you need to own it. I'm one of those good blacks, good black, went to a good white school, had amazing white teachers and coaches that supported me. My under 13 rugby coach picked the best players before quotas, Mr. Dirk Kutsia, brilliant, brilliant coach. Myself, Blessing Vilaga, Aziwaz, Mkize, people like Sane Lengema, uh, Pagamani Ngumalo, uh, Leroy, uh, Upiri, Sponse, Nuzaman, like picked the best and we were dope and he developed us into something special Mr. Dirk Kutsia and we went up and when I got to high school Mr. Harold Khos made sure that people like myself Mfundo Makoba Mapita Stole Sipo Makaza Pilani Mbele we got to play Sizwe Bengu Mzamo Mbuli Stevan Zung may he rest in peace we got to play because we were good Sizwe Zondo one of the best rugby players to come out of Newcastle High um, Mr. Uh, Van Rensburg, Kali, Kali Van Rensburg, Colin Gunene, Abram Bele, myself and Sizwe when we were playing first team. These were amazing coaches, but a lot of the coaches were racist. They wouldn't pick black boys. And I played rugby boy. The number of times I was called a kafir on the field, off the field, when you try and shake hands with the white boys afterwards, they skip your hand and they only shake white hands. Racist. Some of the coaches. They shift your position to this day. If you're a black boy, there's no way you can play fly half. Fly half is meant to be for the, the smart white Afrikaans boy. The one who can kick for poles. The Andre Pollard. The Mornay Stain. It can't be that a, a Magazole Mapimpi is playing number 10. That's an important position. I believe this racism goes all the way to New Zealand. If you look at some of the Maori players, they normally just relegated to wing. These positions where you have to wait to catch the ball and then you must run really fast that's why we have to send a shout out to people like Richie Mohunga in New Zealand one of the best fly halves New Zealand has ever had we don't have that shout out to Damien Willemser one of the most talented fly halves we've ever had shout out to Alton Yankees one of the most talented Florida boy one of the most talented fly halves we've ever had and I remember seeing Alton Yankees and Jean de Jong standing on the side of the field and Heineken Mayer not putting them on the field and it brought back those emotions of these two players of color who are better than the guy that are on the field are being put on the field for so long and they're going to get the last two minutes to play. 
which is normally what happens with black players. People like Ohanya Nishimani, who have to wait, and they only get like five minutes at the end of every game, and by the time you look up, the guy's got 20 caps. But they're not real caps. They're just five-minute sections segments which don't really amount to anything. You can't really be called a legend when you haven't really played on the field and made an impact. That's another part of the politics, how much time you get on the field. And some of these racist white coaches and selectors, they give the black boy such little time on the field that you never get a chance to see how good he is. So when it's time to select, no one has seen him. They're like, we can't select him. He's not good. We haven't seen him. But it's because the coach made sure the boy doesn't get time to play. And then they play you out of position. You're a fly half. You can kick 60 meters. At Craven Week, I don't know if the boy made it from Paul's Boys High. They've got a colored fly half who is cooking. Baby-faced assassin. JC Mars, their fullback. Cooking. Colored boy. Uh, Jody Rose, the Rose brothers. Jody Earl was sensational. During my years, I think Jody and I were both 1986 babies. Cohen Bosch, of course. Uh, Cohen Friesler uh, from Grey PE at some point. Um, this year's Craven Week, uh, Paul Boys, the 10, the 15. Um, Noord Jevel in the West Rand <laughs> bought some of the most talented, I think, black, dark skin colored boys. The fly half, I hope, makes SA schools. His name is JT Kapank. Please watch out for him. I think their fullback center as well may have made the Lions team. I'm not sure of their names. They've also got a scrum half that they bought as well. They buy these players because they know they're cooking. I remember back in the day, um, the coach, I think he might be at JP now, Spilaus. He used to be at Dale, then he went to Kez, and he started recruiting all these boys from Dale. People like Wandile Mjegev who moved from Dale all the way up to, to Kez, and Wandile became super sensational. Um... Kez this year, shout out to Umzwa Kenkosi, who was a Kez old boy, who ended up coaching the first team, who's been a coach at SA schools. He's done really, really well. And this is from a leg up again. This year, they've got a fly half who can kick a ball maybe 70 meters. Uh, Spiwe Moyo, or Simpiwe, Spiwe or Simpiwe Moyo. Sizzling boot, I think he's in grade 11. Mbuso as well, uh, I think he's playing first, second team. My brother used to coach them. My brother was at St. Stithians, then he went to De La Salle, then he went to Danefin College. But he's coached at the Lions junior level. So he knows a lot of these boys. A lot of these amazing boys uh, from junior levels. Um, there's a number 13, the captain of JP Boys. Huge, built like a machine. He didn't make Craven Week. And I think it's politics. There were rumors about he's not South African, he's from the DRC. But there have been so many non-South African boys making Craven Week. And making SA schools. I know he's number 12 made the team. Um, and I'm not sure who else made that. I think Academy, their number 9. Who's pretty dope, also made the team. Um, in Joburg, they've got their politics. Because normally it's monument. The Afrikaners get to dominate who gets selected. And they get the coaches. Depending on the year, you might get some influence from CARES. Some influence from JP. Um, and that's about it. Every province has got like its core schools. In KZN, it's Glenwood, DHS, Peter Maritzburg College. They get to dominate selections. In Joburg, it tends to be, like I say, monument. Maybe a case, maybe a JP. You might have, like, some St. John's, St. Stadions. Uh, in Pretoria, you've got Afis, you've got Vaterkloof. I think Menlo Park is not doing so well right now. Um, in, in the eastern province, you've got Grey PE. I think Daniel Pinar at some point. Uh, of course, you've got, in border, you've got Salborn, Dale, Queens. But Salborn tends to dominate a lot now. Western Province, you'll get your Ronde Bosch, Bishops, uh, Paul Gymnasium, Paul Roos, Paul Boys High. They get to dominate. Borland, it's, it's Borland Landbull. Like, you've got these schools that dominate. So, anyways, I was, I was just saying that please look out for those boys. They're really talented. If it weren't for quotas, if it weren't for BEE, so many of us who are talented would not get a chance. In the same breath, if it weren't for your dad, if it wasn't for the fact that your parents can send you to a certain school as a white kid, you wouldn't make team. If it wasn't for the fact that you brought good Afrikaans and you brought some with the Afrikaner somewhere, you wouldn't make the team. There are different advantages that people use. Of course, there's talent, raw talent. See how cool is. You built like some type of gorilla. You built like a Yes, sir, it's like a machine. You're over 100 kgs. 
you can sprint really fast. I mean, you think of people like William Smallsmith at Great College, some of these other super, yo, some of the fastest boys you'll ever see. Brian Habana, kiss boy. Super fast guys, super strong. Some of these Afrikaans boys, especially the Lucys, the, yes, yes I saw Ierge Janssen has got a colored boy who plays number six. I think uh, Alp Makar has got a monster number two and a monster eight man. Huge. Alp Makar this year, I think, has got some boys that the Lions craving me. Pogtown boys has kind of fallen off. Some of the Afrikaans boys are both. They've been eating Breifles, Pop, and Vors, and, and Pasta since they were kids. The boys from Grey College. A Grey College. A boy that you must look out for from Grey Bloom is JJ Thron. Sensational as well. So you have advantages. Raw talent. For some boys, it's who your father is. You know, uh, yeah, his father was a Springbok. Ruan Pinar. Skull Burger. So people are on the lookout for boys like that. Um, your uncle, maybe. Which school did you go to? Did you go to Afis? Did you go to Peter Maritzburg College? Did you go to Grey Bloom? You know, did you go to Podge Boys? You get selected. Do you speak Afrikaans? Are you English? Um, maybe you can kick really well. You're not really good on the field, but you're really amazing at kicking and you get selected for that. Maybe you're super fast. You can't really catch the ball. But you're super fast and use those advantages. If it weren't for our advantages, if it wasn't for being black, a lot of us would not be given a chance. And what you do with that chance is then up to you. A lot of black players have been picked up because of quotas and they're just not good. A lot of other black players are given a chance with quotas and you realize this guy is better than all the other people there. John Smith, Schmidt, and Jake White makes a joke about it now. I think he was the third choice, if not worse. Soka. But he was a really great leader. From Pretoria Boys was at the Sharks. Everyone loved him. Everyone loved John Schmidt. Everyone to this day. He's an amazing diplomat. He speaks really well. I think if he was asked the question about quotas, if Jean de Villiers was asked the question about quotas, if Francois Pinar were asked questions about quotas, I do not think they would have answered like Sia Colis. I think they would have explained that, look, we come from a really tough history. And we understand that some of these mechanisms were placed there be trying to fix the imbalances. Yes, they upset some of the black players because they feel like they were picked there because of their color. Yes, it upset some of the white players because they're like, I didn't get picked because I'm not black. But it's a very controversial thing. See, I call you, because he's black, was being put in a funny spot, but he had to protect the boys. Some guys were given those opportunities and didn't use them. Some of the black boys have used them. And unfortunately, there are black boys that don't get picked even though they are good enough because the quota only allows. You're going to tell me in the whole of Western province, with all the colored boys there, especially these Cape Malays that get given bursaries and scholarships at bishops, all the coloreds there, bishops, Weinberg, Rondebosch, Sachs, Tigerberg, Durbanville, Paul Boyce, Paul Ruiz. You're telling me that out of all of that, in a squad of 25 boys, that the Gran Homo coaches are going to say we couldn't find another two black or colored boys to replace the ones that got injured it's a blatant lie you know the rules and regulations you know them we can debate whether the rules and regulations are correct but the bottom line is you know them so as a coach as a selector you go and speak to the organizer you explain we've lost two boys of color can we field two white players or do we need to go and fetch other boys one of the things you need to understand that at these teams they normally pick three teams there'll be a craven week side there'll be an academy side which is the B side, and then there'll be like an XV, 15 side. They have more than enough talent to go and pick from. Again, the white people that are going to defend these things are being racist. Do some white boys get disadvantaged because of quotas? Yes, it's a fact. There are so many white boys, very tragically, who have not been picked because they had to pick the black boy to play hooker. They had to pick the black boy to play scrum off. They had to pick the black boy to play fullback. It is tragic. Now, those white kids are going to end up angry. They're going to hate those black boys that get picked. They're going to hate the coaches. They're going to hate the ANC. They're going to hate everyone, but not realize that this is a legacy of apartheid and British colonialism. This is a legacy of their white fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, that we need to try and fix these things. Because when a Jewish boy gets given funding from Germany, there's a German boy that loses out. And that German boy can get as angry as he wants and say, oh, I hate Jews. And it's like, do you understand that we come from a history of Nazi Germany where we oppressed and killed Jewish people? 
Unfortunately, some of us will lose today because of the decisions made by the past. And if you cannot acknowledge that, it means you agree with the past and you see nothing wrong. And that makes you a racist. If a, if a white American, if a white American person and some of the voices like Candace Owens, etc. If they're going to come and say they don't understand why certain black Americans need to be given an advantage because of the history of America, it means they are defending the past. Is it fine to defend the past? That's a philosophical question. Dominant people will always dominate. When you are stoic, which Rob Herself is, which I am, which Tebocho is, which Andrew Tate and other people are, if you're stoic, you're like, look, that's why I can say things like we were conquered. Do I wish we had merit? Of course. Do I believe in meritocracy? Of course. Do I think black kids should be given a leg up? Maybe they should fight for it. it becomes a philosophical debate. If black kids are not good enough, don't pick them. Let them fight. Let them win the white racist Afrikaner coach's heart and get picked. That's my view. That's a stoic view. That's a view of the world as a jungle and everyone must win. But it's also a privileged view. Because the reality is for young kids down there, they don't understand. The reality for politicians who are voted in, they have a mandate. Whether it's the ANC, whether it's the National Party for, for the Afrikaners, whether it's British leaders, they have a mandate. You can go and debate the mandate. Are you willing to fund the mandate? Are you willing to, etc.? That is the conversation we should be having. We need to protect the boys, as Ukobani Bobo said. And I remember even in Ernst Van Sale's tweet when I responded, I said, this is really sad for the boys. It's sad for the black boys that got injured, whether black or colored. Um, it's sad for the white boys that replaced them, who are now going to be seen as, as the bad guys. It's because of you guys, we couldn't play in the final. It's sad for other black colored boys who were meant to be picked in the place of the injured boys. It's sad for the white kids, if there were any that were better than the black colored boys that were picked in the first place for being snubbed. It's sad. The racism is not just on player level, it's, there's racism at coach level. I am fully integrated in South African rugby. I understand racism at all the levels. When Ashwin Willems pointed at uh, Nas Buerta and um, St. Andrew's boy, Nick Mallet, ex-Springbok captain, Nas Buerta, ex-Springbok superstar. When he said, I, I understand your undertones. Ashwin Willems comes from the Western Cape where he was part of gangs and rugby saved his life. He's like, I understand your undertones. You guys think I'm here as a favor. You guys think I analyze sports and I say things as a favor to me. I've earned my stripes. I worked hard. Nas, you not just, you weren't just talented and I'm just black. Nick Mallet, you're not just talented and I'm black. I earned my stripes. I worked hard. I deserve to be here. So many white people got angry. Oh, Ashwin is pulling the race card. Oh, the race card is tight. For some of us, we knew exactly what Ashwin was speaking about. And a lot of white people that don't understand this have have internal racism they do not see. They have prejudices they do not understand and we have to expose it to you. That's why at some point, not now because it's been dirtied, Black Lives Matter was an important movement. It was meant to highlight the things you do not see, your bias. The fact that I really love Penn. Penn is such an amazing guy. You love Penn because he speaks good English. You love Penn because he understands the rugby jokes. Oh, I will fuck up Michael House. Oh, you Hilton boys. And your fucking candy floss. Oh, St. Andrew's boys just have money. Oh, you JP boys, it's because you... I understand the, 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 the jokes and the, and the chirps. I understand the rugby life. I can understand why certain white Afrikaners are racist. When they say things, I'm like, like first on my mouth, it's alright. I understand the colored struggle. I understand the brainos. I understand the black struggle, the black boy who has to catch... Yo, I remember... Um, He's a springbok as well. Before Magazole Mapimpi, we had not Mzwandi Lestik, we had Uluazim Vovo from the Sharks. And I remember him being interviewed and him explaining that when he started, he couldn't afford a car. He didn't have a driving license. So he had to catch taxis to go to the cage in Durban, the shark tank, to go for practice. And people don't understand that struggle. The white kid whose parents rented him a flat there near Moses Mapida, you know, the black boy who comes from Maybe Kersney and his dad got him like a small car so that he could drive to practice. They don't understand this black boy who went to Esalanat, who went to Ependugan, who because of rugby development, shout out to Lincoln Kaba, Nobabum Chali, you know, who I was exposed to them in KZN development, in KZN. 
Because of the development structures, they got to be picked as a quota. Because they were picked as a quota, they got grooming and conditioning so that they could become better. And then from there, because they work really hard, they gym, they go and they make the team. But they still come from poverty. Their salary, which is normally, they are underpaid. I remember Lionel Mapu being underpaid at the Free State Cheaters. I think Kutueba, Joseph Dweba spoke about being underpaid as well. Um, you don't understand their struggles. They get underpaid and they still have to send their money home to take care of their families because of the legacy of apartheid. So when you tell that guy, he must be picked on merit. Ah, oh, sports is the one place where there shouldn't be race. Bullshit. Sports is a career. People get paid in sports. Sports is a multi-billion dollar industry. Across the whole world, sports can change your life. Sports can take a Siakolisi out of a dusty township, take him to a good school where he in, is now a man of pedigree, where he is now with blue chip people, where he can get a white girl who can see him because he comes from a good school and not because he's from a dusty township. And he gets to mingle with Johan Rupert and other people. And he can take his colored kids to better schools. And he can earn money. And he can be part of Rock Nation. And he can travel the whole world meeting top sports people. And he can become an icon. And he can set up businesses. Brian Habana, the Dungani twins today are in business because of sports. And you're telling me, oh, sports is the one place they shouldn't be raised. Fuck that. Sports is the place. The reason I'm so comfortable with kids from the top private schools in this country is because of sports. It's because rugby allowed me to realize I am as good as these guys. I can look at boys that went to the top rugby schools and tell them I would have made first team in any of your schools. That's why I don't fear you. On top of that, I speak good English. I would have been a top academic at any of your schools. I would have probably been head boy at your school. But sports allowed me to see that world. And for people to underplay it is ignorant for a lot of people. It is stupid for many people. And it actually is, in fact, racist. It is racist because you either see it and you want to push it away or you don't see it and you don't realize that you're biased. Our prejudice is a Zimbabwean kid going to start a study at a, at a township school and the township kids at that school treat that Zimbabwean kid bad. And that Zimbabwean kid won't get picked for the soccer team at that school because they are Zimbabwean. It is kids like, um, I don't know if his name is Exhaust, this boy from JP Boys being sidelined because he's from another country. Meanwhile, he's like the best player at JP Boys. He's their captain. Amazing, amazing young man. We are prejudiced. A woman comes into a space and you're like, oh, what is a woman going to understand about medicine? Oh, it's a woman coming into a trading space and the guys are like, oh, this is a boys club. Now I have to fucking tiptoe around the women because they're going to get sensitive. Sorry, did I harass you? Did my words hurt you? Fuck you, bro. We need to learn tolerance. And if you are genuine, if you are genuine about meritocracy and merit, as some people claim to be, if you are genuine, you need to understand that some people, even with merit, need to be given a different type of platform. One of the reasons I love rugby so much is because it is one of the most inclusive sports for men. Rugby, for a fat guy, is a position for you. It can be a prop. If you're sort of chubby but a little fast, you can be a hooker. If you're tall, maybe lanky or tall and big, there's a spot for you. It's called being a lock. If you're tallish, sort of well-built, you can either be a flank or you can be a center, especially if you're very fast, or an eighth man. If you are a short little small guy, there's a place for you. It's called scrum off. You can be a scrum off. If you're tall and you're a visionary and you're a leader and you're a decision maker, you will play fly half, you might play fullback. If you are just really, really super fast, sleek, like a greyhound, like a cheetah, you will play at the wings. Rugby is inclusive. Tall, short, fat, thin, slow, Fast, there's a place for you. Smart, dumb. You know, in rugby, we like we laugh. Well, I used to laugh because I was a fly half and a fullback. So we're like the smart backline guys. We're, like, we're the guys that score the tries when the honeys are like on the side. Number 10, number 15. Bring kisses to the honeys. 
And then there's like the fatties who ate all the pies. We laugh at them, but we love them because those are the guys that fight for us. And then they're like, the, they slow, super slow. And then the guys who are normally like slow brain, normally the locks, you have to explain like the calls to them like 20 times. Nye Yaku, that's a faith three. Ye moet hier spring. Nye verstaan And we laugh, it's a fat joke, in, even in the African circles. The flower halves and the guys laugh at like the forwards. We're like the forwards are the dumb O's. Backline are like the smart, good looking O's. So it becomes like a fat joke, but it's, 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 it's what builds brotherhood. It's one of the reasons why I believe boys, men should play rugby. Especially black boys in South Africa. What saddens me is that a lot of the English schools, especially the private English schools, are kicking rugby out because they say it's dangerous. How are we going to have masculine, strong, young boys, young men that can defend society and women if we're not giving them the last place where men are legally allowed to run at each other and punch each other without getting in trouble? Everywhere I go, I tell people, I tell parents, especially mothers, black mothers, please take your boy to play rugby. He is going to get exposed to racism, <laughs> which is going to build character. He's going to get exposed to running into other boys. If he is small, he's going to get tackled and get hurt. And it's going to force him to toughen up, become strong. Rugby is where boys become men. Some of us, rugby has built us into having a thick skin. We can deal with racists. We can deal with all kinds of rubbish because we were developed in those spaces. We can laugh. And you, when you're in rugby spaces, you get exposed to colors, whites, blacks and you learn because a lot of black kids are not exposed to white people sadly you get to learn that there's smart white people there's dumb white people there's really cool white people there's really whack white people there's white people from rich homes there's white people from poor homes there's white people whose parents own big businesses there's white parents whose parents are like nurses or they cleaners somewhere and you realize that white people are different and some of these white guys you get along with and they become your mates some of them hate you just because you're black. Some of them hate you, not because you're black, but because they think you're arrogant. Or they hate you because you're better than them. I remember, man, I used to be scared to tackle when I was young. I think all boys do. And you grow balls, kahunas. You know, you grow balls and you learn to tackle. And you, and by the time I got to high school, boy, my confidence levels were so high. By the time I got to varsity, my confidence levels were so high. I look at another man, another boy, and I'm like, I'll fucking run circles around you, boy. I will step you into fucking next week. I will tackle you fucking back to your mom. Rugby does that. It's a arguably toxic male space, but it builds character. And you build genuine brotherhood. Some of us pick up uh, Afrikaans there. Today, when you meet a white Afrikaan, you're like, Gaan het meneer, gaan goed. Shake his hand, firm handshake, look him in the eyes. If you're wearing a cap, pick up your cap. Mooi loop. Parank meneer. Create something. Grape Bloom have got their own handshake. So if you're into Grape Bloom, they've got a specific handshake as well. You learn things like war cries. If you ever go online and you see Parktown Boys came through with the band. Abo Queens Dale with Dick Guijo. Um, shout out to Kulumang Matingwan and the Guijo squad. He went to St. Andrews and he went to St. John's. They've set up the Guijo squad, which has infiltrated the Springboks as well. Uh, they sang it Guijo with the last Springbok campaigns. Um... JP Boys, Cares, Michael Arsene Hilton with the Blazers set the trail. It's a great space. And because I'm still obsessed with rugby, I used to be super obsessed. I get to see the up and coming young boys. When you meet some of the top business people in this country, um, you realize that the school culture is a big thing and the rugby culture is huge. Yanni Muton, uh, the founder of PSG, which invested in Pioneer Foods, Curo, Capitec, and other businesses who's called the Buddha Buffett, the Buffett of, of South Africa. He says he'd rather hire, again, this is where sports is important, he'd rather hire a boy that played for a third team than an academic who never played any sports but is a genius. He's like, what I know about this third team boy is he understands teamwork. He understands going to practice every week. He understands winning and losing. And those are some of the cultural aspects that we want in our company. For those of you that may know, a lot of the old boys have got ties from the schools they went to. And when they go to job interviews, they wear their old boys' ties. Because there are going to be people there, whether in the interview room, or whether when they're walking through the offices, they're going to realize, that's a Graham College tie. That's a great PE tie. 
hey, that's a Maritzburg College tie. That's a Glenwood tie. And just by knowing which school you went to, especially if it's a good rugby school, they kind of know what type of man you are, the character you bring and what you bring into the, into the company. And they hire you from that. I've had many mates tell me that they got hired just from their old boy's tie. They get into the interview, they meet an old boy either from their own school or from one of the schools that they played against. And 10 minutes interview and then another 50 minutes just chatting about rugby, school, how things are going. That's advantage. That's one of the reasons why people would want to pay certain school fees to get their kids into certain schools. This video is long because this topic is very important, very sensitive to me because of my lived experience and because so many people don't understand it. Including my mates now, Aaron Fonsell, Rob Hersoff, many other people, they don't get it. And I'm happy to keep raising this conversation and to sit and to debate and it will get emotional and we may have to cool off. I've been in certain WhatsApp groups that Rob added me to that I left because of the racism there and I've told him, you guys are fucking racist. And then Rob will leave and like, ask Pen, are you okay? I'm like, Rob, I don't think you guys fucking understand. You, you guys can fucking understand and see some of the racism here. You need to understand I'm a good black. I'm the black that's meant to understand. And I'm getting touched. Now imagine all the other blacks out there that you guys don't like. The Julius Malimas of this world and other black people. And then worse. Because they still kind of, under, there are worse blacks out there. If you guys can't listen to me and understand me. And try to change your behavior you're never gonna even begin understanding those people and when they don't vote for you and when they want to do certain things you will not get it because you have this biased white perspective and you're so blind to other people's perspective i've been trying to shift perspectives that side i try to shift perspectives from the black people's side so that we can see each other so that we can be the spring box i don't like you don't like me you're muslim i'm christian you believe in African customs, you're Zulu, I'm Tosa, you're Afrikaans, I'm Indian. But we're here for a common cause. We're trying to build a safe, clean, well-run country. We're trying to build a great economy and we need to work together. And it's going to give a little bit of give and take. You have to give the, the little Indian Muslim girl a chance to leave. To, you have to give the guys a chance to go to prayer. Oh, but look, they fucking go to prayer, bro. I would, no, bro. You have to understand that this little black ZCC girl from Elim Popo doesn't understand the culture of going camping over the weekend, going to shoot guns. You guys understand us because we go hunting together, because we go camping together, because we go watch the rugby. That little colored girl is not into that stuff. She loves church. She loves series. She wants to watch the Kardashians. You guys want to identify with each other, but you're meant to be here for a common goal. Because she comes here and she's great at the finance. And that other guy who fucking hates whatever... He's amazing at sourcing business deals. And that other guy who doesn't play rugby, didn't go to a traditional uh, boys' school, etc., etc., can't really speak English, can't really speak Afrikaans. He's amazing at ops. The, the floor is always clean. The stuff, things are always in order. We need to come together and work. We need to come together and build like a South African identity. One identity of what we're trying to do. You can keep your culture, your language, your school, your rugby, etc., but realize that now that we're here, we're trying to do something. When Gran Homo Craven Rica said, it's so that young boys can be given a platform to potentially springboard their lives into tertiary education, to a professional sports career, into networking with some of these other boys. Where else can some of these black uh, colored boys ever interact with the children of big business people, with the children of wealthy people, the Ruperts, the Oppenheimers, the Mudons, the Hersoffs, the whoever's. You get to meet these kids in a space where it's fun, we're playing sports, we're laughing, and I would have never been here if it wasn't for rugby. And I'm thankful, and you guys need to understand that it's a little bit of give and take. And if the little white boys, some of them are being sidelined, isolate who these white boys are, and then find a way to bring them into the system. And let them know and explain to them, guys, it comes from history. I think in Germany they've done really well that they teach the history of Germany to everyone so that German kids understand. I don't think we do enough in South Africa. I don't think young white kids understand realistically the history. I don't think young black kids, especially from the rich private schools, I don't think young black kids understand the history of these countries. You hear a lot of these things, oh, bro, fuck, I didn't grow up during apartheid. I mean, that thing doesn't matter. Some of the con comments on Twitter were saying things like, these kids were born way after the ANC took over. But we're still living in the legacy. There's a black kid today that is growing up in a township. 
He didn't choose to grow up in a township. It's because of the legacies of apartheid. Do you blame the ANC? Partly yes. But the ANC didn't build the apartheid system. They didn't create Bantu stands. They are supposed to fix them and they're not doing a great job of it, but they didn't create those things. And that little black kid in that township didn't choose to be there. But you, white person, don't have the same sensitivity for that black kid that didn't choose to grow up there that you have for the white kid who is now suffering because this black kid needs to be given a leg up. Because this white kid from suburbia, who's actually better than the black kid, he inherited privilege from the systems. So what do you suggest? Because if we're going to go merit, and if we're going to go stick to what you're good at, there might come a black leader that is going to fundamentally win the minds of black people. And that black leader is going to be like the British, like the Afrikaners, is going to say, black people, stop buying from white businesses. And then your white businesses will collapse. And they'll say, stop working for black, uh, white businesses. And your white businesses will collapse. And they'll say, stop living in the suburbs. Build up the townships. There might be a black leader that does that. And it will be great. Black people will applaud. Some white people are like, oh, finally, black people are doing for themselves. But then white people are going to lose. Because the white privilege you sit on is because black people buy from your businesses. And when they buy from the businesses, that business can then sponsor your kid's first team. That business can sponsor your church. That business is able to pay you the fancy 50,000 rand salary you have so that you can go on, on nice holidays, so that you can have a holiday home, so that you can live in suburbia and drive a nice car. It's because black people bank at Capitec. It's because black people buy at ShopRite. It's because black people watch DSTV. It's because black people work for your businesses. So there needs to be some give and take. And if you guys don't get it, if you guys don't get it, if you're not willing to listen to me, we're never going to fix this country, number one. And if ever another leader, I'm not talking about Julius, I'm talking about a true black radical leader. Because South Africa hasn't had a Malcolm X. South Africa hasn't had a Robert Mugabe. South Africa hasn't had a Thomas Sankara. South Africa hasn't had a radical black leader. I know a lot of white people are scared of Chris Hine. But you might find radical black leaders who are actually going to do the things that you fear. Who are going to become the black versions of Adolf Hitler. And you will not like it. And by then it will be too late. You'll be like, we should have listened to Penn. But we refused. And we could have avoided this. And now we've created these monsters. That are killing, raping, beating us. And there's a genocide. A real genocide. Not this pub farm murders that Afri Forum and other people push. That's bullshit. I understand why they're pushing it. They have a mandate from their funders from their members but there's going to be real hell to pay and it won't be good enough you can have all the guns in the world as a white english afrikaans person but there are 4.8 million of you and there are 48 million black people this is literally like 300 million americans trying to fight 1.3 billion chinese and 1.1 billion indians we have a person that can take out all of your people and then we still have multiples more and if we don't fix this thing, and if we don't become truly non-racial, and if we don't understand the sensitivity of these stories, we will never win. And then you will also lose people like me. I'll be out. I'll be like, you know what? I'm out. I'll either book out of South Africa, or I'll book out of these conversations. And I won't say my bit. I'll keep quiet, and nothing will ever get fixed. And people will carry on being fake shocked when there's racism, and this person was killed because of race, and now oh, we've got farm murders. Why is this happening? It's happening because people like myself will have kept quiet and we're not willing to explain. And when we do explain, you guys are not willing to listen. I hope this video is received with the good intentions that it was made with. Penuel the black pen. Penuel the pen. Penuel the swart pen. Cheers.